All right, so the last speaker before the coffee break is Jan Zahn from Leiden, and he's going to talk about intertwined order and the hair of the black hole. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, thanks, Jan, for organizing this wonderful meeting. Uh, we always seem to pull the best meetings uh, in Europe, at least. Uh, looking forward to the remainder. Yeah, um, you heard this word intertwined order. Uh, I'm not, not quite sure whether that was uh, new for some of you. Uh, Goa talked about it. Uh, I talked about it this morning. And I'm, of course, the condensed matter middleman. I'm not really a professional think theorist, but having a long history in condensed matter. And I have to say, I'm really intrigued by it. There, there, there's a side of holography that I didn't expect, and uh, a bit mysterious how it works, but very intriguing. And that's basically the story I want to get across in the next half an hour. Before I do that, uh, I cannot resist this temptation to tell you why I am interested in holography. And uh, in, in these days, you better use the language of quantum information, so how does it work? We have uh, two quantum bits. All of you know that the Hilbert space is four-dimensional. Uh, they have the usual EPR business. We have three bits. Your Hilbert space already becomes eight. In one gram of normal matter, there are basically 10 to the power 23 quantum bits. Now, the size of the Hilbert space is 2 to the power 10 to the power 23. Of course, an enormously large number, and to keep track of all that information, what you really need is a quantum computer. Uh, classical computers, normal mathematics, etc., cannot possibly keep track of all that information. Typical energy eigenstates are of the form that all these 2 to the power 10 to the power 23 configurations are in coherence of position, are entangled with each other. And how can it then be that we actually understand anything of nature? When it comes to states of matter, that's all about vacuum states, we have been actually cherry picking all the material you find in standard textbooks of high energy or condensed matter physics deal with very, very special vacuum states. They're called short range entangled product states. How do they work? It's very simple. Take a piece of rock, you know how it works. You have atoms, you put them in real space wave packets, and they make a periodic array of real space wave packets, and it translates into this product state that's morally equivalent to a single string of classical bits in a computer. And they're supposed to test the surface perturbation, see, restore locally entanglement, but uh, that's about it. This is also true for these states that uh, we're conventionally called quantum liquids, such as the superconductors, the PCS wave function is manifestly a product, and also the Fermi liquid, right, that uh, derives from the Fermi gas, and the Fermi gas is a product state in momentum space. So it's very, very intense in real space, but at the end of the day, uh, entanglement is representation independent. So when it is product in a momentum space, it's just a classical state of matter. Now the question arises, of course, do all ground states have to be of this kind? And some people think that that is the case, but it's just based on what they can compute. Now, in condensed matter physics, more and more it's realized that the only problem that really matters is called the fermion sign problem. We typically like fermions at a finite density that are strongly interacting. And uh, when you work your way through, you find out that your past integrals get negative probabilities, blah, 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 blah. And there's actually a claim that you can prove that, that the, uh, uh, the sign problem is MP hard. NPR is just exactly the same thing as quantum complex, quantum supreme. Right? So when you don't have a Fermi liquid or a mean field derivative, because things like PC is always hard to fucking condensed matter, conventional mean field, it seems that it has to be a strongly entangled uh, quantum state of matter. Right? Uh, an extensive part of that Hilbert space is sitting according to the position where you go to the ground state. This is really the reason that I'm interested in holography, right? Because the case is growing that holography is basically a machine that's computing the physics of kind of maximally entangled states of matter. And it basically related to this. It's from Konopitz's uh, business, uh, I guess all of you are aware of it, and you can read it really like, uh, we get more and more evidence that this is really the secret of holography. This is relevant to nature, most likely, we have been staring at it already for many, many years. And uh, uh, the uh, king of the hill in this landscape is really high to see superconductivity. It's best studied. It's most obvious how it works. 
And the bottom line is, after 40 years, it's still a very confusing business, and we don't quite understand it. As Kurt emphasized this morning, um, much of the emphasis has been on these strange metals, because uh, their holography uh, seems to tell most. As Sarah already uh, said, and Kurt as well, there's also this stuff here at low energies, uh, next to the superconductivity, uh, that's very interesting. And the flow is basically like that holography is also uh, saying very interesting things about what's called the intertwined order. The way I like to, to view it is that this metal is basically like a generalization of the Fermi liquid, a strongly entangled generalization of the Fermi liquid. And uh, this stuff down here is basically like the strongly entangled generalization of BCS-like instabilities. And out of this uh, come patterns that are extremely hard to understand based on normal mean field theory, meaning the short range entangled product business, while holography seems to do it without any effort, sort of automatically. And that's the message I would like to get across. So the main of the program is, first I would like to give you a bit of an overview of what this intertwined order is, as it is alive in condensed matter physics, and it will take quite some time for it, for the simple reason there's a lot to tell. And then I will have a little time left to uh, further uh, 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 go on with stories like uh, Zero told this morning, how holography is dealing with this. So what is it trying to get order? In the first place, it's very important. During the last 10 years or so, it has been the main focus point in the condensed matter community, mostly because there are a lot of things to see for the experimentalists, so they have work to do. It involves forms of symmetry break that are exotic, not seen elsewhere. They really is what we're seeing for the first time in IPC. This uh, word intertwinement is referring to something that is, you know, semantically hard to grab. It's a bit like a symphony orchestra. So you have horns that make a lot of noise, you have violins that make a lot of noise, and they tend to compete each other, and then there's this director that orchestrates it in a nice form of music. Intertwined order is like nice form, orchestrated form of order. The real big deal is that it's really incomprehensible departing from conventional is short range and product state in field theory. So what is it? There's of course the high TC superconductivity, but there's also stripe to spring charge order, pair density wave order, loop currents, and the breaking of parity. First, the kind of typical way that uh, condensed matter physics start out. That's by writing down a Herbert model. Now, what is a Herbert model? It's really a toy model. Uh, it's sitting in the extreme unclap limit, so you assume that the atomic potential is extremely strong, so you're dealing with atomic states, and electrons can just tunnel from one atomic state to the other. Now, you start out saying, let's put one electron for every atom out here, and let's sprinkle them uh, of all these atoms. And now I want to uh, move an electron, so I take the electron and hop it to the next site, but now you're dealing with atoms, and what you do here, you make out of two neutral atoms a positively charged and a negatively charged uh, atom. And when you compute this energy cost, this equivalent energy cost, that's called U, that can be quite large, much larger than the hopping. Right? So uh, that means that you have a strongly interesting uh, system right like, down like this. And then you have this, uh, this, this phenomenon that although the charge gets localized, it's just a traffic jam, uh, it's a very classical physics uh, uh, deep inside, but you, you uh, can still have uh, quantum fluctuations, virtual fluctuations, and what they do is these spins can still move freely, but by virtual fluctuations they develop an antiferromagnetic exchange, a super exchange, which is the fact that these kind of insulators are typically antiferromagnetic. This is the starting point of the cooperator. These are the uh, parent insulators, and then you start to dope it, and when you dope it, all hell breaks loose. Here, the fermion sign problem hits maximally hard, so it is, has become the benchmark for people trying to uh, get a hold on these fermionic problems. When I was a young kid, just uh, out of grad school, I was very lucky because I was putting around this Hartree fog. And I asked the question what, we, what does really happen uh, in Hartree fog when I have the dot bond insulator without any bias? And I just stumbled into the phenomenon that, that, that later became famous under the name Stripe. So how does it work? 
These holes are uh, accumulating on these lines in two dimensions, but they're special because when you look there, you see the antifire magnets, so these are not insulating domains, and then you find out that when you go through the uh, stripe, actually the antifire magnetic order around the flips. So it's like uh, up, down, up, down, up, it's down. Right, so these are charged domain walls. Those are the first example of intertwined order. You see here the orchestration of things. Now back in 1987 when I figured this out, there was already uh, a good understanding uh, available of how to think about it. This goes back to the 1980s, then there was a thing uh, raging on this matter of physics called the sushi behavior, soliton. In our energy physics is known as the active Remy zero mode, how does it work? Uh, this is about this piece of plastic polyacetylene that are di dimerized. They make a kink in this dimerization pattern, the main wall in this dimerization pattern, and it gives rise to a mid cap state that's made half out of valence and half out of conduction band states. You plug in one uh, electron, and this thing is actually only carrying a spin because this gives you a spin on. When you take that uh, electron out, it just carries charge. This was the discovery of spin charge separation in quantum less metaphysics. When you do your uh, uh, Hartley Fock uh, mean field theory to Hubbard model, actually the structure is basically very much the same as uh, what you need in uh, polyacetylene, so your order parameter takes the role of these, these, these phonons, your magnetic order parameter. And you find out that in one dimension, you basically make the same solid on defects. So when you have a hole here, you have here just a hole on sitting bound to an antifermagnetic domain wall. When you go to two, two dimensions, uh, the reason to, the way to make this work is by putting these holons on a row and you, they can now propagate along the domain wall so you get the band here, mid-gap band, and when you plug your Fermi energy here, then you can profit from this band gap and you have a stable state. Keep this in mind, I, I take some time here, because this comes back at the very end when I talk about holographic hot insulators. Turns out that these Archie Fox stripes are pretty good. They are all over the place. When you dope a mod insulator, they usually occur. They occur in nickelates, and cobalt, and manganites, etc. However, the, the, the copper is a difference. Here you can really get away with this classical Archie Fox uh, way of thinking. They are literally like that, but in the copper, it's not quite. Let's go fast forward to 2017. The Simons uh, Foundation organized a Simons collaboration to benchmark different numerical methods uh, uh, dealing with these fermion problems. It has been, become a pretty uh, respectable and rather big community trying to crack it with computers. Nobody can solve the sign problem. Everybody has systematic errors. But then they just benchmarked all these different uh, methods on the same problem, which is Herbert for your OVT is 8 and Nexus 1.8. And surprise, 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 they all found the same solutions. These are not superconductors. These are actually all stripe faces. So stripe faces are kind of a good idea. The only difference with the uh, Arthur Fox stripe faces is in Arthur Fox you have a preferred charge density, you want to have one holon per dimensional unit cell, and these uh, big numerical machine stripes care a lot less. You can basically uh, uh, change the density inside the stripe while the energy is really staying very, very flat. You can about go from uh, one hole per dimensional unit cell to half a hole without any uh, case energy. Why this is, is not understood. And so this is now seen as a very big success and these people are basically claiming we have managed to solve the Herbert uh, model on the computer. Keep this in mind, the stripes come back at the very, very end. So, they were actually observed in, uh, already in 1995 in a very particular kind of coup race. They're called 214 coup race. You don't know exactly what, uh, what, what that means. It really became politically correct. There was a lot of fighting about this in the uh, mid to late 90s, but it became politically correct when uh, the scanning tunneling spectroscopy, spectroscopy machines started to work. You get real space pictures actually of the modernists. What you see here are modernist maps, meaning when you are dark here, it's a very uh, not insulating, and when it's bright, it's more like you are on the stripe, and you see directly the stripe pattern sitting. Uh, forward to around 2007, 
then people started to see the same kind of charge order, also with uh, uh, diffraction methods in other superconductors, they turn out to be very uh, uh, ubiquitous. Um, with one uh, 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 problem out there, when you're dealing with these two on four stripes, they have a sense of this preferred charge density. So when your number of holes increase, you get more stripes, in fact, the stripes get closer and closer to each other, and that translates into a, a relationship between wave factor and, dens and density that's basically like a straight line that you see in uh, 204. But in these other superconductors, the bottom line at the moment is these stripes just want to stick at the periodicity of four lattice constants regardless of the doping. Okay, this is stripe required. It took quite some time because this talks to a lot of you later on. I have now to go very quick in order to not run out of time. Um, you already heard about the pair density waves. I've really no time to discuss the uh, initial evidence and in detail because it's a long story. That's what you would like to know that in 2018 it's very hot because again, Mr. Seamus Davis doing his uh, SCS has signal that when you take a high TC superconductor where the subconductivity is homogeneous, as usually the case, and you apply a magnetic field, that in the vortex cores, you actually see the signal of the pair density wave. And the idea is that when you apply a magnetic field, the magnetic field can, can, can pierce through the nodes of the wave function of the pair density wave, and therefore, uh, it doesn't get destabilized in a magnetic field by the homogeneous superconductor does. It's still quite controversial, the paper in the review uh, at science already for half a year or something, but we take it quite serious. Right? So it's kind of a direct evidence for these pair density waves uh, uh, you heard about this morning, right? the, the superconductor step wave translations. What you need to know is that it's extremely hard to get these pair density waves out of conventional mean field theory. When you deal with bosons, it won't fly because you have nodes in the bosonic wave functions, meaning you will have more kinetic energy. These are never ground states of bosonic systems, so the idea that you just pack your electrons into preformed pairs that are bosons won't fly. In fermionic mean field theory, it doesn't fly either. There's a way to, uh, to go there, it's, all, it's a very, very old, it's, it's uh, FFLO. You take a, a, a normal piece of superconductor, you place a magnetic field, and you get the same splitting of your Fermi surfaces, and then you want to pair it as usual, and you have an excess momentum that gives rise to a modulation. However, when you have no magnetic field, nobody has figured out a way to arrive at the same uh, uh, idea of a subconducting breaking uh, 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 translational uh, invariance. You, only, you also don't see any sign of it in the uh, big numerical machine uh, business. Then, out of the blue, a real odd uh, thing uh, popped up, and it took a very long time to get accepted because, you know, nobody expected it. It's, it's like uh, deep inside you, very, very surprising. And it's what we like to call the Varma loop curve. So the Varma predicted these things for good phenomenological reasons. And then uh, it was measured basically by straightforward magnetic neutron scattering. No time to explain that story. What you need to know is that the basic way that it looks like, you have these copper, oxygen, copper, oxygen, copper, uh, etc., unit cells. Inside these unit cells, you create this pattern of circulating current, that circulate between copper, oxygen, oxygen, back to copper, and they, uh, 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 they compensate each other in the unit cell. So the magnetic fluxes compensate, you have no microscopic mag magnetization. Again, this is extremely hard to understand, these loop currents on base of conventional mean field theory. They were actually first seen in 1987 in the context of the very weird mean field theories associated with uh, slave series. I think it's just, just you know, complete bullshit if you ask my opinion. Uh, okay, in the mid 90s or so, uh, it was recognized that they are part of the whole partners of the wave superconductors. There's also a very pretty, but uh, not very practical story. And the bottom line is that it's just highly unnatural when you're dealing with normal uh, uh, BCS-like BC, uh, BCS -like series uh, uh, dividing from the Fermi uh, liquid. Finally, um, this is a very new uh, 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 type of order. 
was really nailed down in 2016 using fancy uh, optical machinery, like harmonic generation, showing that at this high pseudocap temperature, you have definitive evidence that parity is broken. Turns out that this parity breaking is consistent with the pharma current, and the idea is that the pharma current already switch on at these high pseudocap temperatures. So, the bottom line is that there is this very confusing mix of ordering phenomena that sort of fall out of the air and is really, you know, pretty mysterious. It's really like we don't understand why this is happening. And now it's time to pick in holography. Everybody knows, of course, about holographic symmetry breaking. You started out with holographic superconductor, they have tube business, I don't think I have to tell this. And then there was a follow-up by uh, the previous uh, speaker and uh, uh, Aristos in 2011, where uh, I guess uh, the typical uh, Jerome thing uh, the, uh, started out from a top-down construction, figuring out it's very natural to have these topological theta terms added to your uh, bulk action. Uh, I guess everybody knows this story, it is very pretty. Uh, so uh, when this field tide condenses, it means breaking parity in the boundary, rings the bell, you just saw it in the experiment. The BF boundary is for the first at the final momentum, you get spontaneous break of translation, which is really crystallization in the boundary. And the most beautiful part of this is that it automatically intertwines this translational symmetry break of charge density with spontaneous charge currents uh, uh, popping up as well. It's just associated with the fact that you have this topological term that intertwines currents and the density. Um, at the uh, uh, Reykjavik meeting in 2014, I think it was, Ben Willis also in the audience showed these pictures, so he went to a real crystal, not a unidirectional density wave, but a real uh, bidirectional density wave in two dimensions, right? And again, you see here this nice uh, charge crystallization pattern, and then you see these counter-rotating currents popping up. And uh, that then uh, is in the audience, I guess, and you may remember that I uh, jumped on him after the talk, and I told him, please call this a flux phase, or perhaps a d density wave, because it's exactly like uh, what was predicted in condensed matter physics much earlier. So you see already the intertwinement coming. Then, about a year ago, Li Li wrote me an email saying, Jan, I've decided to add this uh, Stuckelberg term to the uh, uh, theta term action. It's a bit hairy, he will give a talk about it in the parallel session, so interrogate him, whether you believe it or not. It is the minimum way of doing things, it's very effective field theory. And surprise, 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 what you find is next to your current density order, nicely intertwined with that, you find also your pair density wave. Right, so uh, yellow means here, your subcollective order parameter is up, Black means it's down, and it's this beautiful modulation of your superconducting order in space. Out of the air comes the current order, the density order in object at stripes that's coming, and especially also these current loops. Don't get the whole story. Theory and us are basically on the same program, so what you also have to realize is that you have the strong periodic, uh, periodic background lattice that you have to deal with, so you have to incorporate that. And let me go back first to uh, the Harker Fox type story. So you can ask the question, why are they called stripes? Uh, the bottom line is that Ulla Gunnarsson did nothing else than listen to me, except that he pointed out to me that I should call these stripes, because uh, Ulla knew about this business of incommensurate systems uh, that was raised in the 1980s. So, what you see here is a uh, uh, graphene or graphite uh, uh, surface, and you sprinkle xenon atoms on top of that that wants to form a triangular lattice, and then the lattice constant of the xenon crystal is a bit larger than that of graphene, and there's a commensurate mismatch, and the, the way this is resolved is by so-called discommensuration. So here you have beautiful commensurate domains, and all the mismatch is stored in these localized regions that's called discommensurations, and they form 
a periodic uh, lattice, and this is called a, a striped lattice in that community. So why the heck did, uh, do we call these stripes? This Herbert model is a toy model. You may uh, keep me partly responsible for its uh, present status, uh, because it was basically my thesis work where it was shown that uh, Herbert model makes some sense when you look at uh, photoemission spectra. There's a much more general understanding of mod insulators. That is basically nothing else than these things are commensurate to our sensitivity waves. So if your electrical system wants to form a crystal, they have a lattice potential uh, underneath, and when they are commensurate, you have the sliding mode of your electron crystal that gets pinned, that gets a gap because of the commensurate, the commensurate pin. Then you start to dope the system, that means that you change the lattice constant of your electron crystal, you get a kind of commensurate mismatch, and it's resolved by just forming this lattice of discommensuration. So the more general understanding of stripes is they are electronic discommensurations. Why is this pleasant? Because now we can actually address real mod insulators, not these fantasies I've seen flying by coming out of you know, holographic constructions, that's all bullshit, this is the real world. We can now make real world bot insulator by just saying we make our spontaneous uh, holographic crystals, we put a uh, commensurate lattice underneath. That's what's happening here. Right? So here you have your explicit uh, lattice underneath, here you have your spontaneous crystal, and they lock in and you get a beautiful, very stable uh, state. This is doing in turn stuff that really look like the physics of a mod insulator. You look in optical conductivity. Uh, before the uh, crystal uh, is uh, uh, ordering, you have just your through peak in optical conductivity. Uh, the crystal orders the uh, uh, sound mode of the, of the uh, uh, li uh, li uh, liquid uh, locks in. It forms this pin mode here that shifts to high energy and it's very large pinning energy. It really looks like interhermic band transitions as you see it in optics. Another fun game is that you can actually make false vacuum by enforcing that the current order is uniform instead of staggered. And you can compute the energy difference here and you find out that when this uh, mod gap is increasing steeply, the energy difference between these two uh, only increases very weakly. It's like super exchange, but now using the current. So I already showed a picture of this kind. It's basically about the uh, uh, ionization flow associated with the pinning. Uh, so the external potential is relevant at the boundary, irrelevant in the, uh, uh, at the horizon. For these crystals, precisely the other way around. And you combine them, you get this beautiful scaling story about how the lock-in happens, how it gets grabbed. This is a product by Sasha Kikun. Uh, I forget to say this, all done by Sasha Kikun and Thomas Andrade and Kurat and me uh, uh, sitting there on the background, uh, entertaining ourselves with what uh, these uh, people produce. This very recent picture by Sasha, we got it, I think, yesterday or so. This actually appears in Pierce Pipe Lens, copper oxygen, copper oxygen, copper oxygen, etc. And now we don't do, don't do anything else than let the system figure out how it wants to order. And what you find is these beautiful, literal, pharma loop current patterns where you see these currents floating around in these copper oxygen plaquettes. It really starts to become something like holographic chemistry. I'm nearly there, uh, two, two, two more slides. Um, okay, now we can dope the system, meaning we make the holographic uh, crystal uh, 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 incommensurate by changing the chemical potential. And surprise, 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 what the system wants to do is discommensurations. We here we see the, change, the, the uh, difference in charge density compared to the neutral system, perhaps not so surprising. But now you look at the current pattern, you see that actually this stripe is also a domain wall in the uh, current order. Right? So the uh, down uh, uh, current is on A, you go through the uh, uh, domain wall here and you find it on B, so letters. And you can make lattices of it. Now you can study how the periodicity changes as function of doping. And what you find is something that's well known in this community of people studying incommensurate systems called the depth staircase. Right? So you find commensurate plateaus at high, low order commensuration, and then you find something like full form of discommensuration letters inside the discommensuration letters, blah, 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 blah. So there's out to be a fractal fair, 
And that's also what this other graphic typeface wants to do. And it's great because it's basically alluding to the fact that uh, sometimes the system, uh, uh, the experimental system wants to uh, do this fixed charge density inside the stripe, and sometimes it just gets stuck at the preferred lens constant like for A. Last but not least is the, the last slide. Um, who had already announced it, what we find perhaps most interesting is that when you get the pinning of the stripe, you get the holographic mod insulator, you expect that your uh, resistivity screams up exponentially uh, activated. In a way it does, because the root sector gets indeed pushed up to high energy, but the kind of critical sector is still left behind, and now the uh, uh, current operator is irrelevant, so you have an algebraic rise of your current very slow. And already since the uh, sort of late 1980s, we were all the time puzzling about that you, in these static uh, stripe systems, you find out that when the order sets in, you have this very slow increase of the resistivity. It's actually, actually a logarithmic increase. There's really no explanation for it. So the hope is that in this context, you really isolate this quantum critical sector, the root sector really pushed away, and now you can try to study the properties of this interesting quantum critical stuff in isolation. How to do it exactly right now is not entirely clear, but at least some experimentalists already started thinking. Basically, to the end, so it'll be a bit late. Let's say uh, you can just read it. The real question is, is this mere coincidence? Shit happens. Or does it reveal some deep and general principle associated with the ordering of quantum matter? Thank you for your attention. All right, we have time for one short question. Well, if there are no urgent questions, then let's thank Jan again, and you talk to him at the coffee break. <laughs>